Hi, thank you for joining us for Cold War Aviation Catap sorry, Cold War Era Aviation Catapults at Naval Air Station Patuxent River. Dr. Jim Gibb will be our guest speaker tonight. Hello, <clears throat> welcome everybody. Good to see you tonight, including some new faces. All right, um, I guess a couple of words of introduction would be uh, appropriate. Uh, I'm not an aviator, I'm an archeologist. I spend my time on the ground or more commonly underneath it. Uh, but this is a project that sort of comes under the category of industrial archeology span and industrial archeology span is something that I have been doing over many years. Uh, although for me, that usually means, you know, grist mills, sawmills, cheese factories, bridges, uh, a wide variety of industrial-like structures. This is the first time I've ever worked uh, on aviation, uh, industrial archeology. span and the reason uh, I got involved in this project at uh, the Naval Air Station Patuxent River is because there was a plan to uh, demolish two uh, obsolete catapults. And you'll see during the course of the talk exactly what these things look like. So I've come on to, uh, I've come on board the Naval Air Station as a consultant. And my liaison is actually on the line here uh, Craig, who is a uh, the cultural resource, I guess your cultural resources manager for the for, for the base. Uh, and so my job was to record two of these structures, one of which was actually demolished, the other one which has not yet been demolished. And the really interesting one uh, probably hasn't functioned since the uh, early 1950s. Um, so I'll get into those details. If you have any questions, pipe up, uh, especially those of you who have uh, experience with a aviation catapults, uh, getting some real-time input from you would be, uh, I'd great greatly appreciate that. So we're looking at uh, St. Mary's County, uh, Patuxent River, the Naval Air Station there established in the uh, early 1940s uh, during World War II, a facility that had actually been anticipated prior to the war as a central place for testing and evaluating military aircraft. And so this is a, mod a relatively recent uh, topographic view of what the base looks like. Those big black lines, of course, are runways. So before we get going, I thought, uh, I never took physics in, in, in high school, and I certainly didn't in college, but I remember Bernoulli's principle. And just so you know, think of this as a cross section of a wing, it's an airfoil. And what makes a aircraft uh, fly? And that is moving forward, getting a certain amount of speed so that the uh, air pressure above the wing is lower than it is below the wing. And that gives you lift. The other concept here, of course, is inertia. Uh, anybody who's ever driven a car or been in a commercial aircraft knows that when you go from a standstill and you start moving forward, you could feel a little, usually a little bit of a lurch. It requires a lot of energy to overcome that initial inertia to get the vehicle moving down the pavement. So just understand that it's, uh, when, when I'm talking about these catapults, it's really important to understand that the object is, is to get up some speed so the aircraft can get up off the fl flight deck. Okay. So the Navy, you know, of course, wants to, and has for a long time, wanted to launch aircraft. Prior to World War II, uh, often those were reconnaissance aircraft, fairly light, uh, lightly armed, if armed at all, uh, usually not flying great distances, so they didn't need to carry a lot of fuel. During the course of World War II, of course, that changed a uh, lot. Aircraft had to go uh, fly greater distances, and they were carrying a lot of ordnance, uh, both uh, for aerial combat and for whatever their mission is, usually involving very heavy bombs. So the Navy had a series of uh, requirements they need for these uh, for launching aircraft. First of all, they have to be fairly compact. You know, a ship is has a lot going on, and you can't take up a lot of room simply for launching the aircraft. You need a lot of room to store the aircraft, for instance. 
Uh, whatever that system is, it has to be very low profile, preferably flush with the flight deck so that, you know, you launch aircraft, well, they have to come back again. And so you don't want stuff sticking up uh, that uh, an aircraft, especially that's been damaged, uh, might hit because if it hits that obstruction, it's probably going to go flipping over and destroy the aircraft and whoever's in it. Uh, the system needs to be able to produce enough power to get these um, aircraft off the flight deck. And again, the heavier those aircraft become, the more power you need and more speed. Uh, the energy source, I mean, you know, th think of a rubber band. And you put a rubber band between two fingers and take your other finger and kind of pull it back. When you're doing that, you're applying energy, you're creating potential energy in that rubber band. And so when you release it, if there's anything on it, like a paper clip or a piece of paper, it's going to go flying at a high speed. And I think of the same sort of thing for um, a launching system. The question is, where does that initial energy come from? What is its source? And that source has to fit into the existing infrastructure of the vessel and it has to fit within the vessel. It has to be safe. Uh, there's enough danger launching and landing aircraft that you don't want your, own, your power system for, for these launch systems to be uh, a danger uh, in and of itself. And staffing, you know, how many people do you need and what is the level of training they need to be able to launch these aircraft? You wanna keep those crews as small as possible and preferably uh, have a system that requires the least amount of training possible because crewmen get injured and they have to be replaced. And unless you have a really big crew, that could be tough. So those are, those, those are at least some of the requirements. Uh, again, I'm not a specialist in this area. There might be other things we might add to that. So here's a, a topographic map of uh, the Naval Air Station. You could see there's a lot of solid gray there. This is topography, and that shows you just how irregular the topography is in that part of St. Mary's County. When you get out on that peninsula, which is the air base, you could see it's a little more level, and of course made more level by grading than in 1943. But you could see in the topography, you could see the two uh, two main uh, uh, runways crossing one another. And you can see, I've plotted on here, the two uh, catapult systems that I'm gonna talk about this evening. So you have this catapult system, it's operating uh, below the flight deck. Uh, there's, if you look at the right-hand side, there's a shuttle here. This is what the aircraft connects to. And you can see these crewmen here in two separate pictures are effectively uh, putting a bridle a cable that links the aircraft to that shuttle. And in doing so, they have to pick a bridle of the right length because we've got various uh, uh, kinds of aircraft taking off from uh, the air aircraft carrier. And they all have slightly different needs, longer or shorter bridles. And the tension on that bridle has to be uh, consistent with the uh, needs of the aircraft. This is a, this actually came from a manual, which is available online, believe it or not, for a hydraulic pneumatic system, uh, the H8. And what you see here at the, the, the top is, this is the shuttle and how the bridle connects to it. And then of course the bridle connects to the aircraft. So the aircraft, it, the shuttle uh, drags the aircraft down the deck, the aircraft gets uh, goes faster and faster and starts lifting off and eventually uh, is released from the bridle and takes off. And uh, yeah, you could see a larger schematic of it uh, below. So this thing is really, most of it is below the deck and only that little bit, that little um, bit of a hook st sits above the deck for low profile. Uh, this gives you a better idea. Now, th this, this is a later technology where they're not using a bridle, but you could still see the slot here uh, in the lower left-hand corner 
the shuttle will be flying down that slot and it connects to the aircraft. I'm gonna talk broadly about the two different systems and then specifically about the two specific catapults. There are actually two of these uh, hydraulic pneumatic systems or were, well, are uh, at P Pax River. Uh, one was demolished, I guess, several years ago and I've never seen it. It's at the far end of the uh, runway. Uh, and the other I was able to get into, it's the H4. And you, this is all below the surface of the ground. So this is a, essentially a vault on the ground. And you'd hardly know it was there, especially with all the paving for the runways about. Uh, but it's got a fairly sophisticated, almost uh, Rube Goldberg type system uh, of engines and, 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 and pneumatic cylinders and whatnot, all hooked to a cable system. And so through this engine, they increase the potential energy on that cable. They let it loose, that cable pulls the shuttle down the runway with the aircraft attached to it. And once that aircraft gets to a certain speed, it lifts off and is loose from the bridle. And this is pretty much what uh, we saw underground at Pax River uh, last May when we were documenting these things. And just uh, part of the machinery you can see here, and you can notice a uh, number of indicators that the operator is managing. There are indicators for all sorts of things about you know, pressure, uh, bridle tension, all sorts of things that have to be monitored with a small crew. Uh, manning each of these posts. So this is this is aboard the USS Independence. It's the H-4, which is a variant of the one that's at Pax River. And then the electromagnetic systems. These have a bit of a history. Uh, electromagnetics were uh, developed in the early 20th century uh, uh, for rail transportation, or at least they were conceptualized. And uh, the a prominent figure in this was this fellow, Albert Albertson. And what he designed was this electromagnetic that uh, involved both the carriage on which a rail car sat and the tracks. And using electromagnetics, the idea was to essentially levitate the uh, rail cars so that a, an engine hauling these cars using whatever power source, diesel, coal, steam, whatever, uh, could pull these things along, there'd be a lot less friction. So they'd be able to move faster and more cost effectively. The object of this, these early systems wasn't propulsion. Uh, the idea wasn't for the car electromagnetically to move down the track. It was simply to reduce friction by essentially lifting the car up above the track. Uh, here's another example of it. Yeah, in fact, this is you know, from the patent that Albertson had filed. The object is to reduce the friction incident to the movement of the cars along the track or way, whereby high speed may be attained with trains drawn by light, light locomotives or motor vehicles. So it's not really, um, it wasn't conceived of as an engine, as a motor. It wasn't meant to uh, move something uh, along a linear distance. It never caught on. It was never applied that, uh, at least I've seen no uh, uh, evidence of it ever having been used. But interest did reawaken uh, in the uh, early years of the war, uh, of World War II, and really developed for several years afterwards. And so here's a section drawn. Here are two engineers working for Westinghouse, uh, uh, Maurice Jones and Ruel Jones. I've done a little bit of research into these guys. I haven't figured out how, if or how they are related, but they were the principals involved in developing the, um, uh, applying for these patents. And so here you can see a, um, oops, up at the top, you can't quite see it, is, it would be the shuttle. And all of this mechanism almost looks like a, a, a railroad car is down below the track. And so it's their design, not necessarily this specific uh, design, it was patented, that the Navy employed initially uh, at a yard in Philadelphia, the initial experiment, 
And then in, I think, 1945, late 1944, uh, developed a system down at Pax River. And that system was referred to as the XE2 uh, or the electro catapult. Uh, I've taken uh, one of the patent drawings, I've kind of redrawn it to, for greater clarity. But this is basically, think of, think of the shuttle as sort of a really large skateboard. Uh, that uh, rides that uh, has ha part of the magnet built into it and part is the, the, the track. The track has been described as a, a squirrel cage electrical motor that's been uh, that's cylindrical but sort of cut and then stretched out in a linear fashion. And the idea is that you apply through a series of segments of the track, you apply a great deal of electrical power, which creates a magnetic field. And it's the interaction of that magnetic field with that of the shuttle that causes the shuttle to move forward. And there's always a little bit of a time difference between uh, what's going on in the track and what's going on in the shuttle, and that's what moves it forward. I know this is a very general kind of vague description, but I don't have the physics to go into detail on how it works. Um, but you get the sense. It's an electromagnetic. It's a linear induction motor is technically what it's referred to as. This is uh, actually, I think, the fellow with the hat in this picture with the fedora uh, is Maurice Jones, the engineer from Westinghouse. And you could not notice under the aircraft this thing, you could see some chevron stripes. This is the sh uh, shuttle. Uh, later uh, developments uh, led to a much smaller and largely sub uh, subterranean shuttle. And you can see the bridle sticking up too that connected the aircraft to the shuttle. So this is, um, oh, I don't know what the date on this is, probably about 1950, late 1940s, very early 1950s. In 1946, uh, when it was completed and actually operational, there was actually a one-page um, article in the Westinghouse Engineer uh, describing the basics of how this thing worked. And if you're interested, I can uh, you know get a hold of Allison and she'll um, connect you with me, and I can send you a copy of this. But it has some basic descriptive stuff. So in the uh, lower paragraph, left-hand side, it talks about well, this thing's 1,382 feet long. And I got to tell you, from the statistics, you know, from the numbers I've looked at, these, uh, you know, you'd have these fairly long runways, but these aircraft were off the ground and under 500 feet. Uh, it's made up of 76 sections, each 18.2 feet. And it's those sections that would be electrified in series. And that's what created the movement. Uh, the magnet. Uh, it's uh, the that sh that shuttle is only about five and a half inches high. Uh, the re and the last three hundred eighty two feet of the track, they say, was used basically uh, to uh, slow down the shuttle once the aircraft had left the ground, and then of course to bring it back. And I'm not going to talk about the retraction system; it just isn't enough time this evening. And I'm not talking about when the aircraft land, the arresting gear. Uh, that hasn't been part of my study at all. Uh, there's details, you know, 10,000 kilowatts, you know, over in this part of the paragraph, maximum speed of 225 miles an hour. And the thing about, you know, this airspeed and depending on the size and weight and aerodynamics of the aircraft, you need different speeds before you get uh, to lift off. But these things will be reaching 130 to 200 miles an hour in the course of five, 600 feet. I mean, it's just incredible what could be uh, attained with this uh, mechanism. The paragraph uh, down here where it starts the power plant and control station, that's of interest because that's what I actually looked at in May of last year. Uh, not the electropult, as I'll get to in a moment, but the actual power plant. And so this has some details, uh, details that we were able to see once we entered the facility. And that is 
it's all powered by a Pratt and Whitney aircraft engine. That's with a diesel powered, well, I guess uh, aircraft fuel powered uh, engine that is what generated the electricity through a, uh, a direct current motor, which then through an alternating current motor and then a heavy flywheel in which potential energy is built up and that upon release sent that shuttle uh, scurrying down uh, the runway. Um, so anyway, th this is available. Like I said, it's just one page PDF. This is a photograph from 1957, um, kind of a spectacular year because uh, yours truly was born then. Uh, but you could see on it the footprint of the Electropult over here. And over here, you can see the H4 uh, pneumatic catapult. You could see the slot in the runway for the uh, pneumatic catapult. And you could see a really long slot for the Electropult. And I haven't figured out why it had to be, unless it was designed that you could launch an aircraft on a southeasterly heading rather than a northwesterly. I don't know. Um, remains to be determined. On the left is that same photograph from 57, and on the right is that uh, photograph from uh, 1982. And so here you could see the pneumatic uh, catapult. And, oops, sorry about that. And here you can see the runway for it has been resurfaced. So in 1982, this clearly is not in operation. Here's the electropult over here. You can see the runway for that. It's concrete, it's deteriorated, uh, discolored. Uh, this clearly hadn't been used in some years. I can't tell, the resolution isn't good enough, I can't tell whether or not the electropult itself, which is built into the runway, had been filled in at that point. All right. There we go. So this is a uh, 2022 aerial photograph. So you, again, you can see uh, the lower of the two is the pneumatic catapult and the electropult is up here. You can get a better look at the runway as it looked uh, last year. And again, the resurfaced runway uh, covering over uh, what was left of the uh, pneumatic system. And of course, runway 1331, which is an uh, active runway. Actually, the one uh, between the electropult and the H4B also was active, I think. It just wasn't active while we were working there for um, obvious reasons. So here's a map of it. You can see a little bit better. This line here, this is actually the electropult. This is where you had these uh, segments of steel and copper running some 1,300 feet. And building 119 isn't the uh, electropult, it's, it's really just the, um, it's the power plant. As I like to say, it's the battery into which they plug the electropult. The actual electropult is the engine and a drive system self-contained. Building 119 provide the electrical power and some control systems, but those control systems could have been put anywhere. The actual engine and drive system is uh, in this slot running down the runway. That's as opposed to the pneumatic system where a large part, and as you'll see in the next few pictures, you'll see the, the actual engine and much of the drive system was located in this building. And really mostly what ran under the, high, uh, under the runway was uh, the cable attached to the shuttle. So let's look at each of them individually. Here's the pneumatic system. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember the square. It's a pretty big building underground. Uh, and it consists of a large equipment room with a subterranean mechanical pit, a control room, a mechanical room, electrical room. There, was even, there were even places where the crew could uh, sleep. There was a bathroom in there, a small bathroom. 
and uh, a couple of cots. So uh, staff could actually, the crew could actually, you know, spend some time in there. I don't know what they did about food, if they ain't there at all, but they could spend ex <clears throat> spend uh, extended periods of time in this building, which is completely underground. Off of that comes this tunnel, and it's this tunnel uh, through which <clears throat> where the uh, bridles were kept, among other things. It's all entered uh, through a hatchway with this counterweight, so uh, you can easily pull up uh, the hatch and climb down those steps into the facility. So I'm going to take you sort of a walking tour of this thing. Uh, part of the uh, engine, and you could see the cables and the track on which uh, the parts would move. The other end of it. and this part here. So it's a fairly massive engine and connected to a series of pneumatic and hydraulic uh, systems. And what's really important, which kind of makes it kind of a Rube Goldberg sort of thing is that it's all designed to pull this cable, which runs through a large pulley, which among other things redirects the force. So the, the cable heads down, um, the runway. And there's there's various sorts of machine um, uh, elements in this. I don't know a lot of details about them. We've not been able to collect that information. A lot of it is probably available in that, <clears throat> excuse me, that manual that is available online for the H8. And presumably a lot of, uh, much of the system is, is similar. So we could figure out what these different pieces are used for. And certainly anybody with experience operating this thing should be able to give us a nice tour of them and explain how each of the components works. So just another part of the system. The uh, control panel, uh, although in poor shape, was is largely intact, but you can see the amount of rust around this thing. Uh, there was a, there's been a fair amount of uh, stormwater leakage and groundwater leakage into this facility, uh, but as you'll see, nowhere nearly as bad as there is with the electropole. But notice this uh, system of uh, indicators. There's a close up of part of it. You see bridle tension gauge because again, different aircraft require not only bridles of different length but different amount of tension. Oh, I didn't. Okay, so we're gonna, uh, most of what I showed you is right here in this equipment room here. But, let me go back up a second. In the tunnel here, in this little alcove, you could see these things painted on the wall. I'll give you a close up of it. So these are the different aircraft uh, that the uh, the H4 would launch. And over on the right-hand side, you can see them listed, their abbreviations. Um, and you can see the specifications for the bridle length, six foot, 11 inches, eight foot, six inches. Only For only one, I can't even read it, uh, do they indicate the tension. Um, perhaps that information wasn't necessarily in this part of the building, I, I don't know why. Um, but it's sort of a kind of a cheat sheet. So when you get your instructions from above ground, you'll what's taking off, they can use the appropriate bridle, provide the appropriate bridle length. <clears throat> this is that, um, the electropult, and I, I don't know the year of this photograph, but you could see things are kind of deteriorated. But what I wanted to show you here is these three rectangles here and three here. These are part of a massive ventilation system. Uh, you got to figure there's some pretty big machines working in these things. They're producing a lot of heat, and that needs to be cooled down. So you have intake and you have outtake and large fans that circulate the air. So the electropole. Again, this is not the electropole. This is the building in which power was generated to charge the electropole. And so normally you would walk in through these stairs in the lower right-hand corner, there'd be a, a plate that uh, 
could be pulled up and you walk down these stairs into the building, into a series of rooms, uh, basically, I mean, it's called call a secondary room. To me, it's really the control room. You have the engine room where you'd have this, where uh, this Pratt & Whitney aircraft style engine was located. And that generated power that supplied the uh, direct current, alternating current flywheel generators in the main room. Here again, you have air intake, air exhaust. There's a lot of air coming in and out of this thing. We never could see it. You know, it's still buried, but we assume that there's a fuel tank buried under the ground uh, next to this. And then there's the bridal tunnel that extends to uh, underneath the runway. Uh, among other things, this is where they kept the bridles uh, for the aircraft. So this is what it looked like when we were out there in May 2022. This is the literally the middle of the airfield at uh, Naval Air Station, Patuxent River. And this is it. This is, this is the power room right here, building 119. And you can make out the runway here. The electropult is actually under here or was under here. There's the electropult. As it's, I guess that's asphalt. Maybe it's concrete. I don't recall. But it ran down the runway going both ways here. So this is looking to the southwest. But the actual electropult would have been in what looks like a filled in trench here right down the middle. Now, we don't know if the Navy remove the electropult. Uh, I suspect they did because there's a lot of valuable steel and copper uh, in that system that uh, certainly had value. Uh, but it's possible that it was simply just filled in with concrete. This is the entranceway into uh, the uh, building 119, the power plant for the one for the uh, electropult. It looks dark, it is. <laughs> This thing has no windows. It's pretty dark once you go down there. Before we could go down there, uh, the contractor who would eventually demolish this thing had to pump out, I don't know how much water. Uh, this thing started filling up when they first built it. Uh, but you know, it's Southern Maryland. During the summer, you dig a big hole in the ground, it's gonna fill with water, you know, between groundwater and rain. So that wasn't a big surprise. But even once it was completed, stormwater and groundwater would get into this facility. And to heights of uh, ranging from eight to 10 feet. So this thing was essentially filled with water periodically, especially after it was no longer used, you know, sometime beginning, let's say by the mid 1950s. And this thing, when the electropole was no longer used, the power plant would be of no value. So it was closed up and it just kept filling with water. This is the hatchway, uh, which is at the other end uh, of the building, uh, uses a counterweight, as you can see the counterweight system here on the right. And this is not only for access to get in there, uh, it's just a bunch of pieces of rebar that is set into concrete that serve as the stairs. But this would be the point where the crew could actually monitor takeoff, uh, where they can communicate readily with the ground crew. And also, very importantly for the system, they could photograph the takeoffs, both with still photography and moving photography. The reason being, remember, this is a test and evaluation facility. They want to see uh, not only how these launch systems work, but they also want to see how different aircraft, different designs, uh, accommodate or uh, work with the system to see if, you know, is, is, is this particular system suitable to this kind of aircraft? Do certain adjustments have to be made, et cetera? So it's test and evaluation. So there's a lot of collecting of quantitative data. There's a lot of photography. There's a lot of subsequent analysis. They're not just launching aircraft. They're testing those aircraft and they're testing the launches. So here's an example. Um, this is actually of the um, hydraulic system. And you can see this little hatchway here, and that's what these folks are doing. Uh, actually, this guy looks like a, might be a photographer here, although he's pointing the wrong direction. 
Uh, and this is an, you know, an F2 uh, Banshee. And you can see the uh, bridle that connects it to the shuttle. And once after several hundred feet, this thing's off and flying, the bridle drops away. And then that shuttle is retracted. But we've got all kinds of instrumentation here, cameras monitoring how this particular aircraft, the H1 model of the Banshee, how it uh, behaves with this particular system. So again, here's, here's the layout. Uh, let me remind myself of why I put that there. Oh, yeah, this is a really dark place. <laughs> uh, no natural light. Uh, even after pumping it out, there is several, several inches to half a foot of water in the different rooms. And under that, a, um, a muck that seemed to consist mostly of rusted iron. It, it's pretty nasty, actually. Uh, and very difficult to see. It's all artificial lighting. And especially in this room here, the main room, the engine components and the electrical systems were so crowded. It, we, we basically had to climb over pieces of machinery to move around that space. And it raises, an, for me, an interesting question. I mean, it's a big airfield. They could have made this room as big as they wanted. Uh, the the other the the pneumatic uh, the uh, pneumatic system the H four is you know, about almost twice the size of this in terms of square footage. Why didn't they make it bigger? Because being so small, you're concentrating noise, heat, humidity. This must have been a pretty nasty place to work, I would think. And I suspect the problem was they were trying to sell the Navy on using this system on aircraft carriers. And they felt it was really important to keep the system as small as possible, to take as, up as little room as possible on a carrier. And that's why it was made smaller than perhaps would have been convenient for day-to-day uh, -day use. One of the ways we really got to see the machinery was to basically remove the concrete roof. Uh, that admitted light. It also dropped a lot of rubble on everything down below, and that presented its own challenges. Uh, one of the benefits to me was I had something to walk on and, you know, we weren't sloshing through water and, and muck. This is a series of three photographs that kind of pitched together, but it shows you some of the electrical systems, part of the uh, engine with electrical system behind and a close-up of that. I don't know. I mean, in the foreground, we're looking in the center, we're looking at part of the DCAC uh, engines connecting and uh, maybe a little bit of the flywheel in the background. The electrical systems, I really don't know anything about. And here you have another look, a different angle. Um, and this is just, just big motors generating an, uh, uh, that power that is then applied to the electropult, uh, electrifying in series, the segments of the electropult going down the runway. This is a view in 1949. Everything looks really clean and shiny. Uh, now, it had been in use before 1949. So, and this is still a staged photograph. So my guess is it was kept fairly clean and tidy, but it's got a little more polish on it, you know, for the publicity photograph. But you could see the block and tackle system above for, you know, lifting these things, uh, uh, lifting cowlings to provide access for repair and for actually lowering them down in the first place, I suppose. And this is that same thing. Let me go back here so you could see this part of the machine here, and here it is uh, last year. Everything is heavily rusted, again, because there's been uh, rising and falling water levels in this thing for 70 years. And a little more of it. This is an image, again, once the roof has been taken off this thing, we can actually get some light in there and see. This is the ventilation system. So we've got, I think, four or five really huge fans 
um, that would bring in air and then it'd be flushed out the other side. So in working in this place, not only uh, was it all artificial light, but, and not only did you have noise from that Pratt & Whitney engine and the, the, the generation system, we also had the sound of that exhaust system go, uh, running all the time. Uh, so this must have been a pretty loud place. Uh, again, another uh, staged photograph in uh, March 1949. And you notice how these guys are all clean starched uniforms and, you know, uh, I, I kind of wonder if the machine was actually running when they took this picture. These guys look way too comfortable. It doesn't look humid in there. It doesn't look especially hot. There are no sweat stains or anything. Uh, but you notice they're not wearing any ear protection. Look at the panel here. So you've got two circular dials and we've got uh, nine of these below. That's it right in the center frame. And so this would be looking into where the uh, engine is, was located. Yeah, it's kind of messy. That's some knocking off the roof. And here's a close up of that same panel. Gives you some sense of the amount of deterioration of this thing. And, you know, there are various sorts of machines and uh, accessory units and electrical panels, relays, all sorts of things um, that were in the structure. Many of them had nameplates and most commonly Westinghouse nameplates because Westinghouse was the principal contractor on all this. One of the things I noticed that the plate on the AC generator initially, and then I started looking at the ones on the rest of the machine, you see all these spaces where you can kind of inscribe specifics about that particular uh, model of engine. You have patent dates here and everything that's on the nameplate, but there's no additional information on any of this. And I suspect the reason being that this was custom built for this particular purpose, as opposed to, you know, kind of standard electrical power systems that might be shipped out to a variety of customers and powering small workshops to powering uh, drawbridges. And so none of that basic information, uh, they, they didn't seem to feel necessary to supply that information on uh, the nameplate. We saw this in the bridal tunnel of the Electropult. And I never could decide, maybe somebody can help me out here if this is uh, part of the shuttle or if this is just something they used for dealing with the bridles in the tunnel. We have a photograph here from 1949 that shows a bunch of, um, I guess they're naval reservists, but they're being shown this, at the time, relatively new system. And the, the uh, staff here is explaining how it works. So you, this is the electropole right here. And so these, these uh, officers are being introduced to the system. The system was never deployed, uh, so far as I can tell, on any US naval vessel or any naval vessel around the world, so far as I know. Uh, so they were introduced to it, but it wasn't something that they ever had an opportunity to uh, use. Here's a, a nice view from a, a publication. Um, and you get a night, you get a really good sense of what this thing would have looked like on a flight deck. The later versions the, uh, would be, there'd be a closed deck. You wouldn't see this. Only the shuttle would be sticking above. So, as I said, uh, they, the Navy experimented with this in the uh, mid to late 1940s into the early 1950s. Uh, they never took it anywhere. Uh, it's not a secret technology. Again, you know, we see the uh, see it born in the early uh, 20th century for rail use, and in more recent years, it's been used in maglev uh, rail systems, particularly I think the Japanese. 
Uh, we're developing, we have been trying to develop one uh, for the Baltimore, Washington corridor, but it's still, it's sometimes on again, sometimes off again. The previous uh, administration nixed it, but the current uh, administration uh, governor, uh, Maryland, seems to be interested in doing this. But the basic technology is not a secret. It's been around. Uh, it just, it's been used in elevators. Uh, there's even been talk about using it for um, uh, rocket launches, uh, NASA uh, launches. It never took, got off the ground at Pax River. Why? Well, uh, part of the problem might have been the power system. The, um, not the electric pulp itself. And that they built this thing underground. Um, and did not ad adequately address the issue of stormwater. Remember those big gratings, those vents for the ventilation system? Those are flush with the ground. If you get heavy rains, as we often do, especially during the summer in Southern Maryland, water is going to go pouring into those things. And yeah, set up a pumping system, but clearly not enough. And also it's in the middle of an airfield. It's really flat. So even if you pump out the water, where's that water going to go? There's no slope. Uh, so I think that room was uh, very uncomfortable to work in. Uh, not that, you know, sailors run used to that. Uh, I had the opportunity with Craig to tour the existing, still operating steam catapult system at Pax River. And it was really noisy in there. And there are people who are spending hours uh, working underground in that facility. The Navy ultimately didn't adopt it. Uh, and I, you know, why did they not adopt it? Well, I think most vessels were uh, using other power sources and the electrical system uh, might've been seen as somewhat intrusive, as uh, uh, kind of an alien system that didn't work with the other systems. It would have um, uh, been isolated and with all that involves, because you have to, you know, if you want to install one of these systems that produces large amount of power uh, to launch an aircraft and it has to uh, quickly recharge, it uh, has its own independent uh, source, and it's totally unrelated to everything else that happens on that vessel. Uh, there is expense in installing this system because unlike just a shuttle with a little something sticking above deck, it's a fairly, you saw an earlier picture of it, it's a fairly large construct on the deck. Uh, and that would have been expensive and using expensive materials. And then of course, it's a new technology. You have a bunch of folks, especially after World War II, you have a lot of sailors out there used to using a particular kind of technology, which through most of the war, as far as I can determine, was uh, didn't involve catapults. Uh, through most of the war, you know, watch any Navy war film, from World War II, and what do they do? They turn that vessel into the wind. So you've got the uh, uh, incoming wind that essentially passes for speed. And, you know, that you got that wind blowing directly at the aircraft, and that helps increase that differential uh, above the airfoil for these uh, aircraft to take off. And in the most early years of the war, most of those aircraft taking off were fairly light fighters. Uh, after the war, you know, you still have these, 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 these sailors, the command structure is still there, and they, they may well have resisted uh, the use of that technology. Kind of unfortunate because it uh, would have been really interesting to get that technology moving a lot earlier. Um, it had a lot of benefits. Uh, like any catapult system that was adopted uh, later in the war, you save that aircraft fuel that it might need for a mission because that initial inertia, uh, the, the energy to overcome that inertia is provided by an external so source, not strictly by the aircraft's engines. Um, and these things could recharge, I think, probably every minute. So theoretically, you can launch an aircraft once a minute, uh, giving the uh, engine system time to regenerate that electrical charge. And it probably took that long to get another aircraft in place anyway. <clears throat> the 
the Navy has now reintroduced that technology. Uh, we just launched a new aircraft carrier, the Gerald R. Ford, uh, last year out of Norfolk. And it represents the Navy's commitment to all electrified vessels. So there's small nuclear power plants providing that electricity. And so now an electropulse system makes a lot of sense because it's using a power source that's consistent with everything else that's happening on, happening on the vessel. So anyway, that's about all I have. Um, I am open to questions and certainly any input. Uh, for me, no project is ever finished. Uh, there's always room to add. There is a report on uh, this project on my recording of these two uh, catapults. And I'd love to hear anything new anybody has to say about it. Oops, that didn't work. So I'm going to stop sharing. Fire away. Well, the main, the main reason it was never adopted for the ship was its main purpose was for uh, island runways, short runways on islands. Hence, it was 1,300 feet long. And a ship would have had to have been 200 to 250 feet long, and they just couldn't generate enough power. Yeah. For shorting it, shorting it that that short to get that much more power to get the airplane airborne, and the airplanes were getting heavier and heavier, which required more and more power. So it just wasn't viable for the ship. Steam like, was way more way more efficient and powerful. I would like to see, and it's not the kind of data probably to be released to somebody like me, but. I would love to see the data on the testing because I was the few instances where it's reported. I find these aircraft are taking off. I mean, you've got all that runway, and really, from the test results I've seen, they're they're only using a few hundred feet of it. It just it's, it's, it's pretty amazing at what they managed to launch. Now, how that relates to aircraft carrier decks, especially of the period, as opposed to those today, you know, I don't know. And could they have? Could they have generated more power? Were they, I mean, that was one system with that Pratt and Whitney. Uh, could they have built uh, larger motors or, I don't know, uh, be interested. Yeah. I'm interested in hearing the engineering perspective, certainly. Yeah, the first steam catapults were 210 feet, 210 feet long. Mm. And they're now 300 feet long. Yeah, and, but the size of the aircraft is is increased proportionally a lot more than that, I can assume. Yeah, the airplanes are 60 to 70,000 pounds now. Yeah. But just think of it, launching but, these things, even that weigh 10, 10 tons to, <clears throat> over short distances at that speed is pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. And for what you said earlier about the Ford, the nuclear plant, does not supply the power to the to the uh, electromagnetic catapult. The nuclear plant supplies the power to the catapult generators. The generators supply the power to the catapults. There's 12 generators on the ship that power the four catapults. And the ship's electrical system powers those generators. Yeah, thank and you for that clarification. And they're uh, inertia flywheel type generators. The power just spins them up to an RPM and then the cat fires and the RPM goes down and then they spin back up again. That's how they, that's how it operates. Do you know what it takes to, what the time, how long it takes to be prepared for another shot? Uh, the cycle time is about 45 seconds. 45 seconds, yeah. Depending, on how, much and depending on how much energy each launch takes, but roughly 45 seconds to a minute, they can shoot the catapult. That's, that's pretty impressive when you think that, especially if you're setting up a mission of several aircraft, the faster you can launch them, the less time the first one up in the air has to spend just kind of hanging back, waiting for the other guys to get up off the ground. Yeah, it's all about sortie generation rate, how many airplanes they can launch and recover in a given time frame. And I think you have to think too about the early World War II approach and before World War II where you're turning a vessel into the wind, 
that's got to take a lot of time. It takes that vessel off its course, and I assume it increases its vulnerability. Yes, yes. Whereas here, I assume there's no need to do that. Um, doesn't matter which way the vessel's going. Nope, still got, they still got to turn into the wind. And do we have land-based versions of the electropult that are being used, or is it purely? Uh, yeah, it's called the Electromagnetic Aircraft Launching System, and there's one in the ground up at Lakehurst, New Jersey. I meant for, you know, actual bases around the world. No. Because at L Lakehurst, you're talking about test and evaluation, right? It's not, they're not actually, it's not part of the general service. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, because, uh, you know, you said... Test and evaluations for the ones that are on the ship. Yeah. You said originally they were used, um, you know, the plan was for short runway land-based, you know, island-type stuff that we confronted in, in the South Pacific. Right. And I was just wondering if that had changed altogether, if it was still planned for that use. Or... No, they would come up with... Uh... So if they needed something like that, they would come up with some assistance on board the airplane by spending multi-millions of dollars to put a catapult on a fixed runway that a couple of bombs could take out very easily. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. So they would put, uh, and they'd have done that on, you know, you'll see it on C-130 that can go into austere sites. They've got JADO on that so it can take off quickly. There's rocket pods on the side of the airplane. I, I must say that uh, my predecessors uh, on this project in, I think, 2017 produced a really wonderful report, detailed report on a little bit on the history of the base, but mostly on these, um, these launching systems. And it would be really lovely if that could be shared. I don't know if, you know, Craig is on the call here. I, I don't know if... Uh, you know, what, what the policy is on that, but it's really you know, a policy do, document. Do you know who did that? Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't remember the uh, uh, firm off the top of my head. Kuhn is the lead author on it. Uh, but it's it's just a nicely done piece of research and involves uh, original photographs from the National Archives, several of which I used this evening. Um, and just, just a lot of nice detail. Craig? Yeah. Uh, is, that, is that a report, something that might be shared more broadly, or are there any restrictions on that? I'll look into it and get right back to you. Because um, yeah, it's, it's, it's such a beautifully done piece of work. It's a shame not to share it. I mean, I wrote a report too, but it's kind of a supplement to what they did. And it's more like, you know, what would this thing look like if we pumped all the water out? Yeah, no. Are you talking about the structural engineer report or the, no? It's the catapult context. By it's the context. Right? Yeah, the context report. Yeah, I think we should be able to re release that. And 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 it's very readable. Uh, even if you don't have this, I'm, I'm sure most of you folks who are on this evening don't have this abiding interest in uh, aviation catapults. Um, but it's still, it's a, a nice example of how you can do research. And it really tells us a lot about the Cold War era, about one little aspect of it. So uh, I'd love to see it shared. Are there any other questions or comments? Yeah, just so, so everyone, the, the current electromagnetic catapult that we have on the Ford doesn't operate like the Electropult operated. It's uh, a lot different. The same roughly electrical, electrical powered catapult, but the way it operates is not same. There's no assist uh, valve. There's linear motors on either side of the catapult and a 22 foot long armature that the shuttle's attached to. And when you fire it off, it slings the armature down the track between the two between the two sides of the linear launch motor. Basically, think of it as a giant solenoid. You know, your your starter motor on your car. Your turn and it pops the gear in. Well, you flip the switch on the catapult and it sends the armature down, down the track. That's, uh, and then they flip, flip the electrical phase power at the end and that's what stops it. They go from yeah. slinging it down to reverse the polarity, so to speak, and that's what stops the shuttle. There's no cabling and, and all that other stuff uh, associated with it. 
Yeah, and which is to me always seemed a little odd with the with the other systems. Well, certainly with the pneumatic system, having that wire rope that dragged not only uh, sent the shuttle down uh, the runway, but then would also be used to retract it. I mean, anytime mm -hmm. you've got lengths of cable like that, it seems to me you you risk all sorts of mechanical problems and or safety hazards. But I, I suspect the um, maglev railroads and the elevators and whatever else is using this technology is also using a significantly different design, but the principles uh, remain the same. Any, any other comments or questions? You all can build one of these now, right? Yeah. I wish I wish we uh, it would would have been great to actually tour both of these catapults with a somebody who actually had experience using them. Uh, I studied industrial archaeology under the late David Starbuck, and he always drilled into our heads whenever you're working on an industrial site, you really want to be talking to somebody who's knowledgeable about the technology, uh, blending that experience with the skills uh, of an archeologist. Uh, and with mill sites and blacksmithies and cheese factories and stuff like that, you could find somebody. It's a little harder when you're dealing with aviation technologies, uh, especially stuff that is probably all classified at some point and through oversight, some of it may still be classified. Uh, but it's been an interesting process. And uh, aside from having to crawl down into that <laughs> nasty water filled hole, uh, it's been quite rewarding. Okay. Yeah, uh, the good news, I think, is that uh, the PAX Museum is trying is going to be putting together a little exhibit on on these catapults, and in fact, they're they are going to show one of the bridles that you're referring to. Um, please, please, we're going to have that up, and hopefully, some more information. Um, yeah. So the, the the museum is just outside the principal gates of uh, the Naval Air Station. It's open to the public. I was there 30 years ago in an earlier iteration of it, uh, but it's considerably modernized since I suspect uh, uh, professional museum staff now. Uh, I did notice one thing, I just ran across one thing with the bridles and apparently those things were quite expendable and some of these vessels used to go through quite a few of them. I guess they snapped or went hurtling off into the water or, uh, but uh, it seemed one, a major expense was replacing them. Uh, I haven't chased that any further. Certainly that wouldn't have been a problem at Pax River because you, know, you, you wouldn't lose them in the water, although they may snap. Okay, well, it's been a pleasure, everybody. Uh, next month, we get back to more conventional archeology. span So I uh, hope to see you all then.